Hello there, welcome to Explain Apologetics. For the last uh, one or two weeks, uh, one week, two weeks ago, we've been focusing our discussions uh, primarily uh, on uh, experts in Christian theology, in the New Testament studies, biblical studies, and so forth. Uh, we've had the privilege of having the uh, New American Standard Bible senior translator, Dr. Don Wilkins, with us. We've had the privilege of having uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy with us to discuss the undesigned coincidences of the Bible. And also, uh, yesterday, uh, we had the privilege of having Eric Hernandez, the, uh, the lead apologist at the Texas General Baptist Convention. Today, we don't have uh, a Christian with us. We had someone who was a Christian with us. Uh, and today's uh, discussion is going to be entirely different. It's not just an interview. We want to have an open and honest discussion uh, with a, a skeptic, someone who used to be a Christian. His name is Pepper Lim. Uh, he used to be a lay church leader, uh, a lay uh, minister, I think I guess you could say that. Uh, he's earned an honorary doctorate in, of divinity uh, via correspondence and also uh, he's, uh, I realize he's the founder uh, of uh, Advocates for the Propagation of Science Literacy, Apostle and also uh, the treasurer for the Malaysian Atheist and Secular Humanist MASH. Uh, if you if you thought that name sounded familiar, well that's because in 2018 we've had the privilege of doing a debate uh, with uh, Two of the representatives from MASH, Nabin Inasi and Willie Poe. That was in First Baptist Church, but it's a joy and privilege to welcome Pepper Lim uh, to uh, explain apologetics for this discussion. Thanks so much for joining us, Pepper. Hey, no problem. But uh, let's make, make it clear I'm representing myself only uh, today, okay? I'm not representing MASH or, or any organization today. Oh, yes, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, we're, we're just glad that as an individual, you can uh, you know, just have this, 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 this just, just a fun conversation to just explain to us because I've, I've been very interested. Uh, we've, I've been doing debates, as you know, uh, against atheists uh, and, and different people of different faiths. But it's very interesting to find someone who used to be a Christian. And that's why our topic for discussion today is why did I leave? The Christian faith. Uh, how, why did you lose your faith? So uh, maybe I could just give you about five to ten minutes for you to just share your story, uh, just to help our viewers understand uh, what you were doing and basically uh, how, uh, where, how how did you end up in, in the atheistic club here? Yeah, I I I guess that I've always had a, a affinity or uh, drawn to religion uh, since I was a young at, at a young age. I actually became a Christian, or I chose to become a Christian when I was in Form 1, so I would have been uh, about 13 years old at that time. And I kind of like, um, wasn't quite happy with, uh, with my family's religion, which was Taoism and Buddhism. And I, I, I was thinking to myself, well, maybe I should just look at other religions. And of all the religions I looked at at the age of 13, I, I thought that Christianity made the most sense. Uh, um, maybe in hindsight that, that I didn't do enough studying, but I ended up saying that a sinner's prayer uh, at the age of 13, and uh, when I was uh, in college, I thought I heard the voice of God telling me to not pursue a, um, a regular degree, but to attend Bible college instead. And that's what I did. So I was in Australia at that time. I, I uh, attended uh, a Bible college in Perth. And I have to say that I enjoyed that uh, theological course uh, like a whole lot. And I decided then that I would want to serve God for the rest of my life. And that's what I did. I, I finished my degree, came back. Uh, I even tried to pursue uh, my, my doctorate uh, to, to, to show that, you know, you, uh, I think studying is an is, uh, is, is, uh, important thing. And uh, being recognized for your studies is also important. It shows that you, you are, you're able and capable of studying. So uh, that's why I pursued uh, um, uh, studying. But it, at that time also, I worked in the church full time. And then uh, I've always been in the church. Even, even when I left uh, full time ministry, I, I still served uh, in some, some uh, capacity. I served uh, in the children's church mainly. That, that's where my, uh, my, my calling was. I, I, that's where I thought that I, I was best used by God. So I've always been in the children's church, ministering to children, uh, teaching the children's uh, uh, teachers. Um, I, I've done um, videos. Whoops, hang on. My, my computer decided to log out. Uh, then uh, then uh, around the age of 30-something, um, 
I started to lose my faith. It, it started to, I started to, started to not be able to answer questions. Now, I, it, I've always had that, that um, being, uh, you know, being asked questions and to think of questions that are difficult. So, and, and whenever I've, I come to a uh, question that I cannot answer, I usually would um, put it on the shelf because, you know, sometimes you, you find the answer uh, later. So, but over the years, I suppose too many questions were on the shelf that could not be answered. And one day, uh, I mean, gradually, I decided to pull myself out of, the, of Christianity and I stopped uh, uh, attending church and I stopped um, believing in God. It, but it was a very gradual process. I, I have to say that it wasn't one of those overnight things that you can do. It, it was uh, not easy leaving, leaving the church. It's not easy leaving your friends behind. It's not easy leaving things that you've known for like years and years and years, things that are normal to you, like praying, seeking God, uh, looking, uh, uh, reading your Bible, uh, thinking of, uh, of, of holy things. And then suddenly you, 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 it doesn't make sense anymore. Suddenly it just, it's not that I'm ang I was angry with God, but it just, God just didn't make sense anymore. I, I think maybe that's the best, uh, best simplest explanation la, that I can give. Um, yeah, so from there, I started to involve myself in other things. One of the things that, I, that opened up was uh, science. So I started to, I decided to make a science club and I thought that I've, I've seen a few science clubs, but they're all usually quite fuddy daddy. So I thought I'll, I'll make a fun one. And uh, the science club, as you know, is the short form is called Apostle. And this was, this was uh, a, a, um, a, a friend of mine called Ramon. Uh, he was the one who came up with this name, Apostle. And then when we asked, when we asked him, what does Apostle stand for? He said, oh, advocates for the propagation of scientific literacy. And we're thinking like, that's such a weird name, but we all love the Apostle acronym. So we, we kind of kept it. And um, we made a few videos. We had fun along the way. We met up with other people who were interested in science. And it was quite fun for me. And then uh, recently, uh, as, you, as you know, in Malaysia, we, we, we have, um, well, we say we have freedom of religion, but a lot of people who are, who uh, are uh, religious people, I, would, I have to say, are sometimes persecuted or looked down upon. So especially the ones that who do not have a religion, people like me. So uh, a group of us decided to maybe start a society called MASH. And uh, I was, uh, this is my second term as their treasurer. Um, it's a very small group. <laughs> I think I think there are less than 20 people in, 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 the, in the group. But we thought that, you know, uh, better to have 20 people than to have none, you know, and, and maybe we, we can do something about it. And uh, the people uh, uh, in the group, are, uh, they are quite nice. And I thought it's uh, interesting to be in. Uh, so that's, that's my story in, in five minutes. All right. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah quite, quite a quick summary of that. Uh, maybe you could <laughs> you just share with us, uh, I, I guess, what were some of the questions uh, that, that actually started the process for you, you know, to, to think that maybe this may not be true after all. What were some of the questions that, that emerged? Okay, I, I, there are many, but I, uh, the big one that really started the whole ball rolling, like, you know, there are questions before and it didn't really bother me until this, this one, I can remember distinctly this one, this one thing. It was the death of my friend's aunt. It was her, one of, I, I think, if not mistaken, it was her favorite aunt. And my friend uh, was really sad. And the, her, her family are, are Christians. The, the family serves in the church. Her aunt's family, uh, uh, family was, were also Christians. And uh, her, uh, her children also served in the church. So I was surprised that her aunt... Uh, that God didn't heal her, that God didn't answer their prayers. So the big thing was, why didn't God answer their prayers? Like even to prolong their life. I'm not saying, you know, this losing, losing a mother is, 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 is quite a big thing. And, you know, you, they, they said that um, she had cancer, if I, if I remember correctly. She, she lived a, a few years and then she passed away. But I was thinking to myself, why didn't God prolong it longer? She, I think she died in her 50s, if I remember correctly. At, 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 I was thinking at the very least, you could have passed away maybe in the late 60s, you know, when the, the, the children were probably married or, or something. At least she get to see her children get married. That simple request also got denied it, you know. And yeah, 
Then the other thing was after I started to when I start, when I started to uh, leave the faith, I started to look at uh, other other things in the Bible which I really took for granted. One the, one of the big things was uh, creation and evolution, and I I I've always thought that uh, evolution was a big lie, and that's what we are, we are taught in the church. And and, and I have. My favorite, of course, is uh, Dr. Ken Ham. He's my like absolute favorite uh, uh, creationist. Uh, I, I've got books on creationism that just proves beyond beyond any doubt that God created everything. But one day, after you know, after losing my faith a little bit, when my faith was a, a little bit shaky, I thought, you know what? Let's let's just put all all bias aside and let's just take a look at evolution. Um, from an outsider's point of view, it means I, I'm not looking from a Christian's point of view. I used to look at it from a Christian point of view, and it was easy to overcome the uh, the uh, evolution arguments. But now I just thought, why don't I just like look at it from a neutral point of view? And I have to say, after looking at the evidence, after reading, after looking, and this is now at the age of the internet, so you you could uh, uh, look at uh, uh, the arguments from the other side now. And lo and behold, I had to admit that as difficult as it was to admit, I have to admit that evolution is the correct uh, uh, fact and creationism is not. So those were, uh, just, just to, if you're asking me for two, so at the top, my, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, I, those are the big two, I think. Oh, but thanks so much. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, because uh, let's, what I'd love to do is to maybe just, uh, let's, let's deal with the first one first. And then we can briefly okay. touch on that because my, 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 my field is not science. My field is theology. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'd love to deal with the first question first and you know, see if we can discuss that. Sure, sure. Uh, but with regards to evolution, let me just start by saying that uh, uh, the vast majority of actually Christian, uh, the, the Christian apologists today are actually, in fact, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say the vast majority, but a good number uh, of Christian apologists are actually very open to evolution itself. So you, you have theistic evolutionists. In fact, uh, the, one of the guys that I brought to Apostle, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Living Lee himself, uh, who we, we did that debate on, is a theistic yes, evolutionist. Remember. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that that itself is not going to be uh, an issue with regards to Christianity. It's not a problem to Christianity because you have uh, a spectrum of Christians that are, are divided on that issue. But uh, I guess the big issue that needs to be discussed is healing, I think, and that's the one that you, you, you raised up. And it seems to me, and, and I'd love for you to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the assumption is that if God loves a person, he would heal them. Is, is that a fair description? Uh, I, partly, I think partly, uh, because uh, uh, we have this, uh, by his stripes, you, uh, you are healed. So it's not that God loves you or doesn't love you. It's like, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, health is yours to claim. So this, this is, again, I, I, um, for, for everybody who else who's watching this, I come from a charismatic background. I, uh, uh, if you don't know what charismatic uh, is, the Hallelujah Church in, in a layman's term. So I, I, we used to, every, after every service, we will have this healing uh, um, thing. And we are, we are told, you know, the, the um, health is, is, no? Can you hear me now? Yep. Is yes, it better? Yes, should, yeah. I, should, I, should I hold it? Maybe I should just hold it in front of my... <laughs> All right. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> is thanks. it better? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we, are, we are taught that health is yours to claim. You, you just have to claim it. It's not, it's not that God loves you or doesn't love you. It's, it's, it's yours to claim. So, uh, um, yeah. So, if you say God loves you, I think that's partly true. But the other part is it's, it's yours to claim. So, uh, by right, anyone who seeks health uh, should, be, should be you. Right. Uh, that, 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 so th this is really interesting because uh, actually I mean, what I'd love to do is since you brought up that passage on by his stripes you are healed and uh, you were referring to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, I would love to look at that yes. passage. But before that, um, one of the key things I believe in the New Testament, and of course, I don't hold to the uh, view. I, in fact, I would say I strongly reject the view uh, that God uh, will heal all that those whom he loves uh, physically. And by healing, of course, I mean physical healing. Uh, a good example of that is I don't think there was anyone that the Father loved more than Jesus himself. And in the baptismal pool, uh, he says to Jesus, uh, you are my son in you whom I love. 
in you I'm well pleased. The father says, states his love uh, to the son. And yet in the garden of Gethsemane, it was the will of the father to crush the son. And, and so for, as someone who goes through the theological to let all of scripture speak for itself, I guess I'm with you and completely with you in saying that those who say that God heals all that they love are seriously mistaken. They're not just mistaken. Is seriously mistaken uh, because you, you, you end up seeing the one that God loves is the one that God puts through the immense pain and suffering. In fact, what's really remarkable is that uh, in, at the end of the gospel, uh, you find uh, Peter coming to Jesus. Uh, and and, and John, this is John chapter 21. And, and Jesus says to Jesus asked Peter this interesting question, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. You know, and Jesus says to him again, do you love me? And he says, yeah, you know, I love you. He asked him a third time, do you love me? And Peter's response is, Lord, you know I'm loving you. And at this point, he's, he's already bawling his eyes. He's crying. Uh, and Jesus says, feed my sheep. And it's very interesting. Right after that, Jesus describes the way that Peter is going to die, which will glorify him. And this is in John chapter 21. So for me, when I, be, I have no problems whatsoever realizing that the New Testament demonstrates that those whom he loves, he puts through immense pain and suffering uh, because suffering, in fact, Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, Paul, the guy who got beheaded uh, and rejoiced before that, says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, for we rejoice in suffering, that suffering produces character and character in endurance and endurance produces character. And we know that the love of God is manifested in all these things. So I think from a theological vantage point, uh, it must be stated that I think those who say that God will heal uh, or that will heal those whom he loves are seriously mistaken. But I think you raised an important verse as well, Isaiah 53, wasn't it? Uh, you, was that a, you, you, did you raise the Isaiah 53 passage? The, 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 uh, by his stripes you are healed. I, I, I cannot remember where, where, which part of the Bible it comes from, but it probably sounds like Isaiah. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll flip to Isaiah 53. Uh, it says here in Isaiah 53, and I want to read this because I think this is one of those verses that is often misquoted as well. Uh, uh, by the churches, I mean, of course. So uh, Isaiah 53, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 7. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, oh, sorry, it's actually verses uh, 4. Uh, uh, let me read from verse 5. This, this is Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Uh, for, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Transgressions is another word for sin. He was crushed for our iniquities. Iniquities is another word for sin. Uh, and in, in Hebrew poetic device, this is actually called a synonymous parallelism, which means uh, it is saying the same thing in two different ways, right? So he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The context is clearly sin. And next it says, upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace. And now here we've got to ask here, what peace is he talking about? The peace is not just peace from man. The context is sin alienates us from God. It's sin that creates an enmity with God, Genesis chapter 3. And the issue here is the peace is strictly with God, not global peace. Uh, because if anything, the Christians didn't face peace at all. Jesus himself didn't face peace uh, in the sense that he was crucified brutally. It's talking about peace with God. And in that next phrase, it goes, by his wounds, we are healed. And in the context I would submit, it is not talking about physical healing. It's talking about spiritual healing from the disease that is brought about by sin. Now, to clarify this, I think we, we, when we realize that, uh, particularly in the, the Jewish context, they tended to view sin and sickness together. So one good example would be when the disciples see uh, this, this man who was born blind, uh, he, he's born blind, which is his sick. Uh, they actually asked Jesus, was it his sin or was it his parents' sin? Right? You remember in John chapter 10, I believe, was it his sin? or Because for the Jews, sin results in sickness. So naturally, when it's talking about by his wounds were healed, I would say in response to the churches, not Pepper, but in response to those churches that believe that, we've got to primarily realize that it's talking about deliverance from spiritual sickness, not physical. And that's why you have people like Paul, uh, who actually says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, three times I prayed to God, you know, to take this away, but he didn't. So I think that is, uh, I, I'm, I just want to give you a chance to maybe respond to that and to, 
in light of you know your experiences in the churches please go ahead Pepper. so the, so it, so now it, it, back, it really begs the question that if god uh, is can heal so why doesn't he heal this is, so this is the, the the that big thing you know so I, I, I do remember, uh, I remember I, 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 keep, I went to seek God after my friend's uh, aunt passed away. Uh, and I really thought, really, if, if I was to think back to all my years uh, being in the charismatic, charismatic movement, after reading about it, you read about all these great healing prophets and uh, great healers like Catherine Coleman and Smith Wigglesworth and, and all these great preachers, like healing preachers. And how the people saw uh, blind people could see and all that. But I've been to so many healing rallies. I've, I attend a church that regularly, like always, every Sunday has this healing thing. But you don't see it. I, I've never seen it. I've never seen uh, uh, people, uh, 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 hunchbacks. I have a friend who's a hunchback. He, he, he was never healed of that. And yet, that, that, that few years, uh, we were, I was attending church with him. I've never seen him not miss a, heal, a healing rally uh, or, or, or a healing pastor, or visiting pastor, whatever. He would always be up there trying to, you know, why wouldn't you want not to be a hunchback? You know, so, but he, he, not him. We had deaf people in the church uh, who were never healed. We had people who uh, uh, were inflicted with, with uh, cancer. I cannot think of a, uh, of a genuine healing uh, supernatural healing that has ever taken place in church, despite people believing in it, people uh, uh, reading about it, people praying for it. But seriously, I, I, could, I could not. And that, that seriously, when, when I remember uh, uh, praying that night about it, I really had to, had to concede that, that maybe this part of the Bible or this part that is just not true. It, it, yeah, that, that, that really drove, drove that nail that nail in for 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 healing and as as what you now say <laughs> yeah it's 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 uh it's not it's not true as well <laughs> right so i i mean just just to be clear i believe that god heals um I mean, and i hope no one hearing this especially if you're watching from home don't uh don't uh misquote what i said or, or misunderstand what i'm saying I, I believe that god heals but i don't believe in healing rallies and i st strongly strongly don't believe in healing rallies why because nowhere in the bible do you find healing you, if you look at the book of Acts, you would actually see that the healing is actually very occasional. Uh, I mean, uh, by occasional means there is an occasion. They didn't plan for it. They didn't advertise and say, we're going to have a healing rally here. Uh, why don't you come for the healing rally? And, and by the way, while you're at it, you know, you can make your donations right here. Uh, <laughs> you don't find that. Uh, you, you don't find that happening uh, in, in the book of Acts. Rather, what you find is Peter and John walking to the temple. And then you find this guy here who says, you know, uh, you know, give me some money. And they say, silver and gold, I have none. But what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So I would actually be honest, uh, Pepper, and tell you that I have not seen healings in the church. Maybe I'm wrong, but to my memory, I have not seen any. So you and I are on the exact same ship here. Uh, and, and, and I think this is good that we actually have this open, open honesty. But I, I was at, just before I came to Malaysia, uh, I was actually at my uncle's funeral and, and I was very close with this uncle. This was an uncle that I was really, really close to. Uh, he passed away uh, just before I came to Malaysia. And it was a, it was a huge shock uh, to me and my family as well. Um, he was a pastor uh, and he was from a religion. Uh, he, from uh, I mean, he was not a Muslim. He was not uh, an atheist. He was from a different religion that I will leave unnamed. Uh, and he became a Christian. Uh, and when he... Uh, when he when he became a Christian, uh, his family naturally didn't accept him, right? So, uh, what happened is his brother, and and this is why the way I knew this uh, is because the brother was giving the eulogy, and he mentioned this story. The brother was a staunch the other religion that I'll leave unnamed because we don't want to attack any religions here. Uh, but uh, and and what the brother did is that the brother said, you know, if you come to my house and you preach about Jesus Christ. I'll beat you and I'll chase you out of the house. So that's what the uncle said. Uh, his brother said to him, uh, and he went and he did the same thing again, right? He's a new convert. <laughs> he did that. Um, and he went to the house and the uncle said, uh, this is what uh, his brother told him. Now I'm praying to all my gods and he has many gods. You know, I'm praying to all my gods um, and, and none of them can heal me from this disease. If your God is real, heal me from this disease. Otherwise, you know, stop, stop lying that, you know, your God heals. And my uncle prayed and he did get healed. 
and he and his family were shocked, came into faith. The whole family came into faith in Christ. And I remember him at the funeral. This just happened about uh, in January, I, I believe. Uh, and, and he was just bawling his eyes out and crying, saying that, you know, he was the one that brought him to faith. My point, Pepper, is that you tend to see these healings outside of church. Many missionaries that I speak to uh, recall healing incidents in the tribal communities in the jungles that they go to. Uh, but it's not something that is advertised. It is not something that gives you popularity. It is something that is very much in the act itself. And I think the purpose of healing, uh, it's very important to dis discuss this. The purpose of healing is for the authentication of the messenger. So Jesus did healings to authenticate that he was from God because he was going to bring about the new covenant. Where in the Old Testament do you see healing? Moses, because to authenticate before Pharaoh, that he's going to bring about this. So the healings that we see in the scriptures are not these kind of well charity things that God wants everyone well and good. In fact, I, I did a debate two years ago that on, against the view that God wants everyone healed, you know, or that God wants everyone to prosper. I did a debate against that because I don't believe it for one moment. But rather we see that, you know, this is what happens in scripture is that the miracles are an authentication. And that's why you find in the book of Acts, the miracles are mostly limited to the first part, the first half of the book of Acts. Once the authentication is done, there's no need for miracles. It gets to the message, the significance as to why the miracles were performed. Now, uh, I did want to deal with the second, the first part that you raised, which was, um, you, you raised, but why wouldn't God heal this person? Would you want to respond to this first or would you want to go to that? Why wouldn't God heal the person? Why would God just let, let a person suffer? I, I, w w I, from after listening to what you said, your, your, the way you explain it, then, uh, then it really raises uh, uh, more questions. Sure. The, well, one question that came to mind is it, the, the healing is way too, too few and far in between. So why would God not do that? If, if, if God is, is powerful and he's a loving God, so why would he not, not uh, outpour uh, healing after all? Okay, let, let's say, if you say healing for, for, for your uncle, it, so what, 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 what's so great about your uncle that he needs to be healed? But what if, what if it was a crippled boy? So why wouldn't God want to try and heal a crippled boy? So... I think that this, these kinds of things that we, we, we sh God should try and heal these kinds of, of, of justified uh, 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 victims of, of you know, sickness or, what, or what, whatever it is. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think that if you say it's to, it's to authenticate um, uh, the messenger, then this messenger should go around trying to do good by, by healing people. But again, we don't hear... Uh, so much of this that we think that oh you know what that these guys really do have the power of God they do demonstrate the power of God it's too far and too few in between so I, I, I uh, could, could I put it down as maybe very rare uh, instances of healing absolutely is, is, it, is it yeah why and why should it be rare I mean, that's a great question, why it should be rare. And, and I think the answer given is that, uh, and, and of course, I do want to ask you, you said that, uh, that God uh, you know, ought to heal it. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, on what basis do you think that there's such an obligation upon God? But let me answer your question first. Uh, you know, why is the healing so rare? As I think my answer earlier kind of covered it. Uh, it actually demonstrates that uh, it's to authenticate because the big issue, Pepper, is not this life. If this life is all there is, then it seems that, you know, that the most loving thing you can do uh, is to make sure that everyone is healthy and well because this life is all there is. But you see, I believe that God wants to heal eternally, meaning God wants all of us so healthy that we will never die again. And that's what the hope of the resurrection is all about. And, and the resurrection is that there will be no more pain. Jesus is ushering this great new world that is going to come. And the authentication, uh, the, the demonstration of that, is his resurrection from the dead. And that's why when most of my debates actually have been involved on the evidences for the resurrection, because that's the hinge. Everything that we believe and we hope is hinged upon the resurrection. Paul himself says, if Christ was not raised, our faith is very much in vain. So uh, everything is hinged on that. So I think a response to your question, Pepper, is simply this, that if uh, the focus is this life, 
then obviously you have a point in hand that God has to heal everyone because that would be the most loving thing to do. But it seems that this life is not all there is. And that's why the apostles uh, couldn't care less about this life. You know, they, they are looking at Paul is, for example, is saying, uh, you know, he's going to get executed. He's going to get beheaded. Second Timothy is his final episode. He's, he's writing joyfully and says, I finished the race. You know, I'm, I've now, what awaits me is this. And, and I think it's life with an eternal perspective pepper that basically results in this and i have no problems whatsoever conceding to you that you're absolutely spot on these miracles are rare they're not often i've not, i mean i've not seen any and and so i'm, I'm not going to come here and lie to you and tell you that uh, you know what the, the, it's, it's happening out there and i've read this book and i've seen this video <laughs> i'm not going to do that so but i think that on the same time uh, and the same token if you believe that god ought to somehow do it because he can, and, and that's the way you phrased it. It'll be really interesting, for, you know, for you to maybe share with us on what basis do you think God has to? What what's the obligation for God? Well, doesn't don't 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 we Christians believe? I mean, Christians believe that. I'm glad you God said we. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, don't 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 we believe that God is good all the time, and He is a loving God, and He He cares for us. Um, but then on the other hand, we say, okay, you, you're, you're, you're crippled. So um, just suffer it until the end of your life. Because when you get to heaven, you have a new body. And I think that that is sort of a, um, uh, how do you say, uh, what, what do you call that word for, for, for excuses for, for not meeting the mark? What, what, what do you call that now? You know, you, 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 you cannot meet it. The, uh, you cannot achieve something, so now you're giving a reason to why you can't achieve it. But actually, um, if you told everybody that you can do such a thing, then you you should prove it and 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 con and do it. You know, instead of just saying that it's it's possible. Like we always say that God is om omnipotent, omnipotent. So why then why would He want to pick and choose uh, whom to heal and whom not to heal? So that that's what 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 is that? Right. I mean, I think that's a great question. But again, I think I, I was kind of like hoping that you would share a little bit more on what's the obligation? Why? I mean, it seems to me that you kind of like repeated the point again, meaning that he can yeah. uh, and therefore he should. And I, I guess my question is, I, I mean, I, I can understand where you're coming from. But my question is, on what basis is that obligation there? Then, then I will give, give the analogy of the, of the guy who, who's walking by a, a, a burning house. And, but he doesn't run in to try and save anyone, even though he can. Or the guy who's, who, who, who walks by a river and sees a guy drowning, and he thinks to himself, well, I'm a lifeguard, I can jump in to save him, but what, what's my obligation to this guy? Why should I save this guy? You know? So this is the, 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 the thing. It's not that we are obliged to do it. I think that we should do it because uh, it's the right thing to do. And um, yeah... Do, do, do you understand? Is, I'm not saying that God is obliged to do it. He's not forced to do it. But I think that God has to do it, or sure, should do it, because that's what He says He does. He does good things, that He is a good guy, that He has the power to do these things. Right. I mean, I just, I just, I, I want to answer that question because I think that's a good one because you brought up God's goodness, right? And I think that's an important point to do. I mean, it, why, I mean, how can a good God not do good? Uh, it seems to be a, a valid objection, it seems to me, Pepper. But, uh, but I, I do want to, before answering that, you know, make it clear that, you know, on the one hand, uh, it does seem that you're saying that God is under, you just said that God was under no obligation. But you still, you still believe that God should do it. So uh, it's kind of like you, you believe it as no obligation, but there is some inherent intrinsic obligation. But let's move on to goodness then, right? Uh, uh, do, do you want to respond to that? No, let, okay, uh, so uh, uh, coming back to the two guys, one mm -hmm. who saw the guy drowning and the other one who saw, who saw the house burning. So it, what, what, would, what, do you think, what do you think the guy would say if, if let's say he was interviewed on TV and they asked him, you saw the house burning? He, he goes, yes. You, you saw people dying inside there. He goes, yes. So he said, why didn't you try and run in to save him? You could have done that. And then he responds, imagine this, if he responds and says, yes, I could have run in to save him. And you know what? If I ran in, I probably would have saved him. But you know, I'm no, under no obligation to, to, to save him. So please, don't, don't, don't be putting the blame on me. I didn't start the fire, um, but... Why, why should I go and save him? I, this is not my thing. This is not my job. Or I'm, 
I'm not obliged. I'm, I'm under no obligation to save him. So please don't be looking at me like, like, like you, you, you think that I, I, I murdered them. I did not. The fire killed them. So, so I think that um, this, is the, I, 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 this is what, I, when I hear you giving that, that example, this is what I heard. That this is what I understood it to be. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good point. So, I mean, uh, what I'll do is, uh, let me explain why the analogy you gave is not quite analogous to God saving people. Uh, but I, I was basically saying why, I mean, my, my question was on what basis, because I just wanted to understand from your perspective, what did you find was the basis of the obligation? Not that I disagreed with you, uh, or not that I'm saying that there is no obligation for God to do good. I mean, if he's good, he has to be good, no doubt about that. But I, I, I wanted to understand what's the basis that you believe the obligation uh, was. So uh, let me deal with the, uh, would, you, would you prefer if I deal with the goodness first or would you prefer if I dealt with your analogy first? Um, up to you. Okay, let's start with the goodness uh, of God first uh, and then I'll move on to your analogy of that. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of this guy by the name of Paul Washer. Uh, you should check him out <laughs> as well. It's a, it's, a, it's a really good preacher. Um, and, and Paul Washer said this, uh, and I thought it was maybe apt to quote him here. Paul Washer said, God is a good thing and that is terrifying because the, very, the, the fact of the matter is we are not good. See, the police is supposed to be good. I mean, imagine if you have a perfect justice system where the police are perfect in every sense of that word. Um, that's a good thing if you're on the side of the law. But if you're a criminal, the goodness of the cops become a bad thing for you because it, the goodness actually depends on which side of the, the fence you are, right? So uh, when, when you put it that way, you realize that the goodness of God becomes a problem for sinners. And I think this becomes a big issue. And I think this is the central theme of Christianity, which incidentally, I noticed that the first, uh, the first thing that uh, you brought up was the fact that Isaiah 53, and again, I mean, this is what you, you have your experience in the church, and, and it's not on you by any means. But um, the fact that Isaiah 53 is talking about sin, but the sin part, at least based on the experiences you've had or the preachers you've heard, was kind of like sidelined to focus on the healing is kind of, to me, the indication of the problem. The issue is the sin factor. And you see, in spite of God's goodness, uh, you have the sinner there, and that, that's where the problem becomes. Jonathan Edwards wrote a great sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and all we see uh, is the love of God, we've missed the point. We've completely missed the point. The cross of Jesus is not about the love of God primarily. It's about the justice of God, the judgment of God, that he would avenge his anger on his only son because of the sins of the world he bears. That's the picture the scripture bears. And, and, and I notice, for example, many people talk about the different faces of God. Why is it that God in the New Testament is so loving and the Old Testament seems so cruel? I mean, if you ask me, the New Testament God is much worse than the Old Testament God. The Old Testament, he only, he hunts down and brutally destroys the enemy. The New Testament, God destroyed his own son. In fact, Isaiah 53, the same passage we cited says, it pleased the Lord to crush him. So what uh, I think I'm trying to, to get at, Pepper, is that we've got to first of all realize that the goodness of God must be seen in the context of a sinful world that's in enmity against him. And let me move on to using this to your analogy of the fire. When we look at the fire, and I would completely 100% be with you in saying that if I saw someone with fire uh, there, I have every obligation, every obligation to respond and say, if I saw someone drowning, I have every obligation to, even if it means risking my life, to save the other person, every obligation. But you see, the relationship between a lost man or a, uh, or, or a sick man uh, to God is not analogous to a, a, an innocent person drowning or an innocent person in the house, it is the, the, a better analogy would be this. A bunch of people come to, the cat, to a palace trying to burn down the palace and destroy the king himself and now find themselves stuck inside with the burning flames. And then the question is, why isn't the good king obligated to save them? The fact of the matter is, that's the, that's the analogy in light of sinful humanity. And my contention, my point, is that the love of God is demonstrated in that he sent his own son in that burning flames to redeem sinners who were out there to against him. Remember, Adam was there 
He wanted to be like God. The challenge was to be like God. Sinful humanity is revolting against God at all times. And we can't simply treat the sinful humanity as if it's just a morally neutral state. It's not. Uh, it, it's very different. And that's why I felt pepper. The analogy kind of breaks down. It's a little bit more, I modified the anal analogy if you don't mind, but I would love for you to respond to me. So <clears throat> that again, um, yeah, it, it's, um, okay, let, let's, let, let, let's, let's go back to your, your analogy sure. of the king. Um, so now they, they've got a bunch of people trying to burn, who's, who is burning his palace. So now he's on the outside. And people are asking, why doesn't he go and save uh, th those on the inside? Now, uh, so then I would raise the question of the, the Christians themselves, those who have actually um, given up their, their um, uh, turned away from sin and now uh, uh, have come into the light. So wh why are there then many sick Christians? Um, it, there was, um, if not mistaken, there was um, a study done and they, they compared Christian and non-Christians and they found that Christians and non-Christians fall sick about the same rate. Absolutely. But if, yeah, if, but if they, they now belong to the light, then you would think that they will have this special priority to be healed or to be at, at the very least uh, kept healthy. I'm not talking about those, uh, I'm not even talking about those who were crippled before or had cancer before. I'm talking about healthy people who would then fall sick. Um, uh, and, and you know, these... these um, these are, uh, uh, what, uh, what do you call that? Uh, maybe I would say, it, probably like my friend's uh, aunt, who are really serving the Lord, and then out the blue, bam, cancer. Or, or uh, now that I think about it, my, my, my pastor in, in, um, in, in, in Australia, he, he was diagnosed with a brain hemorrhage or, or something. And I'm thinking to myself, why, why would this guy, you know, of all the people, the, it's the senior pastor, the, the, the nice guy, the good guy, the one who's serving the Lord, who's keeping his flock together, who's, you know, taking care of his flock. And yet he's the one who's got, who's got this uh, 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 brain uh, uh, hemorrhage. And uh, yeah, that, I think because of that, he had to retire from, from ministry. And he wasn't a, a, an old man. He's not saying that, oh, you know, 80 years old, come on lah. You know, things do happen at 80. I think he was... Maybe in his forties, um, maybe or even early fifties, when he when he when 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 uh, he was diagnosed with that, it was just the, the the strangest thing. So yeah, so why why would why do Christians suffer that then? You know, absolutely. I think there's there's there are two questions actually being raised with that, and the first one is an issue of consistency. Uh, I mean, if, if God heals, then you would expect Christians to be more healed, if you could use that way, than the non-Christians. And I'll be completely with you and agreeing with you and saying that's not the case. I mean, you, you don't need the statistics. I'll be the first one before the statistics to say, no, it's not the case. Uh, if, part of the reason there, uh, it, it, so the idea is that there's an assumed consistency issue that it should, if to be consistent, you would need to see Christians healed. And my response to that would simply be historically, that has never been the case. In fact, all the disciples died young, it seems to be. In fact, the only exception was John. Uh, so uh, if anything, you see Christians dying young and you're seeing Christians suffering, uh, it, it's the norm. That's, that's Christianity, Pepper. Christianity is basically Jesus' invitation was a death sentence. Jesus' invitation was pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. The life of the Christian is one of that is dying to self daily. Uh, and so this idea of God healing Christians and somehow give, making them better than the unbelievers uh, is not the case. In fact, I think Habakkuk raises that issue. Why do the wicked prosper? I mean, if there is really a God with justice, why do we see the wicked prospering? And, and Habakkuk's answer is, I mean, the answer of God is that the righteous will live by faith because there is a day of reckoning coming. But what we see is that the people of God are told to deny themselves and to follow their Lord. Jesus is the example. And as a Christian, the word Christian has the word Christ in it. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm meant to deny myself and to follow him. And that's why it is no surprise, Pepper, to see many Christians in suffering. If anything, that was what the Apostle Paul said, for we rejoice in suffering. In fact, let me, let me read Romans chapter 5, uh, because that, that, this is the Apostle Paul himself, who is supposed to be able to heal people. Uh, but he himself, quite to the contrary, uh, actually says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, uh, 
Oh, sorry, I mean Corinthians. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Says, verse 3 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So it seems, Pepper, that the consistency is actually the fact that Christians suffer uh, is in fact a consistency. It's a mark a demarcation of people who are picking up their cross and following Christ. And the great example of our time would be the late Nabil Qureshi. I'm not sure if you've heard of Nabil Qureshi. Uh, he was a popular Christian apologist, a convert to Christianity. And as soon as he converted, uh, he became, uh, I mean, about shortly after he converted, I think less than a few years after he converted, he was diagnosed with cancer. And you know what he did in the, la the last days of his life? And he just died about two years ago. Uh, young guy, I mean, really young, I think in his 40s, or maybe early 40s, should be early 40s. Um, yeah, and, and what he did is in his last death, from his deathbed, he began put, putting out videos as to God's faithfulness. Um, and his life has transformed so many. So many people have come to Christ as a result of him. And so if you ask me, and, and I hope no one quotes me out of context, is it a good thing that he died, that the fact that he died resulted in many more people coming to eternal life? I say absolutely yes. If you ask me, is it a good thing if I die that many people come to, to faith in Christ? Absolutely yes. And I would, without a doubt, it's a good thing. And as the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. Uh, you know, for me to die is a good thing. And, and that's the view you can only have, Pepper, if you're basically saying, I'm a follower of Christ, that's my master, that's my role model, the cross and everything it stands for. But the second issue I think you kind of raised was the question of why then? I mean, it, I mean, why? I mean, God could have done it in a million or one other ways. Why this way? Uh, and I think Paul's answer to that, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite, it's not going to be the answer you want, Pepper. I think it's not going to be a very satisfying answer. I'll tell you that. Paul's answer is that God chose to use the foolishness of the cross uh, to save those whom he intends to save and to harden those. Uh, who basically uh, stand in objection to it. So uh, if anything, the Apostle Paul himself knows that the idea of this cross is foolishness. Uh, and in fact, one of the most famous verses for the message of the cross is foolishness to the world that is perishing. But to us who, is being, who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. So uh, it's not as if the apostles didn't know this was a foolish thing. It's not as if they didn't know it warranted a certain amount of ridicule. They knew that. These guys knew that. But it seems that it was a consistency that was based on following this radical Christ who claimed to be God uh, and basically realizing that the hope through his resurrection is that he's going to be creating this world and we take a step of faith and saying we want to follow him. That's, and that's why I think it's completely consistent. Uh, and the fact that God allows Christians to suffer, according to Romans chapter 5, very much fits within the text in spite of the distortions we find that are being taught in many churches today. But please respond to that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what's the attraction for to be a, to be a Christian then? If uh, being a Christian doesn't make your life better, um, you such know, a good you, you, you also, yeah. So you still have to suffer. So why would anyone want to even consider Christianity? Um, yeah. So may, maybe you could you could um, tell me what what's what's so great about um, you being a Christian or continuing to be a Christian. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I cannot, I cannot, uh, I cannot possibly emphasize how good that Christian is. Then why then I'll be a Christian? The reason I am a Christian, Pep, and I'm glad, so glad you asked is because first and foremost, Jesus demands, uh, the, the gospel is a command. He commands that I follow him. And it's a command given to the world. I think what has happened so much is that the world basically puts this Christianity as an offer. Uh, it's an advertising gimmick. You know, Jesus offers you a better life. Do you want to take it? Do you want to take it or you leave it? You know, that's not the gospel. The gospel was, like I said earlier, it's a death sentence. It's calling you to deny yourself and to follow Christ in the hope of a coming resurrection. The reason I follow Christ is not for anything that I can gain, but it's because of everything that he has given to me. Since he gave his life for me, looking at the cross, I'm compelled to say, you know what? If there is this God that is so loving, uh, and that has given his life for me, I want to follow him. And he, he is worthy of my life. He is worthy of my death. He is worthy of everything that I do. And I follow him because of who he is. And if that means denying myself 
so be it. It's not very attractive at all, unfortunately. I'll, I'll give you that. It's not very attractive at all. But the question is, is he worthy? And that becomes the, the question even in the book of Revelation. Who is worthy? I mean, the lamb is worthy. He has given his life through his blood and now he is worthy of our following. So I think the idea of what is so attractive about Christianity <laughs> is, is very much the worthiness of God as well. And I think that corresponds very much, Pepper, to the issue in Genesis. Why shouldn't Adam, uh, you know, do basically partake of the tree of life? I mean, who is God to control him? The, the answer is the same, because he is worthy. And the moment we realize who is God, and the moment we realize who we are, that's when actually the relationship comes. And you realize that in spite of that difference, God and man, he sends his son to die for us, inviting us into that relationship with him. So I think that in itself is profound, but by no means attractive, Pepe. And I, I'm sure that you would agree with me. It's not an attractive offer. Yeah, so if, so if it's not attractive, then what's... What, what, why would... Yeah, again, so the, the, you, you've, you've answered it your way. Yeah, I mean, this is the, your personal experience. So you, you follow Christ because um, you, you feel he's worthy of your... Of, of, of your uh, devotion so even though even though you cannot get this you cannot get that you, you there's there's not much benefit to it but for you it's 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 you know it does make sense to follow him but i think that for for people like me this is the thing that really is a it's a head scratcher so why would i want to devote my life to a god who supposedly can give me back certain things but now i find out that actually no wait he he doesn't give you anything you know in fact what he demands from you is death so that's not a very good prospect for anyone really uh, right. and, and then to say that you know you only win this big lottery in life when you die so right. you then you get to go to heaven right. um this is this is very similar to um uh, and sam i think i want to warn you not to keep saying this because this is very similar to what cult leaders do uh, they they do tell their followers that you know um, you should lay your life and and what you get back is something in in heaven and it, I'm not talking only about Christian cults but uh, in almost any kind of cult um, yeah so I, I I really I I, th I think that, that that you you your your kind of struggle with that question is the same that I had but you you seem to have arrived at a conclusion and even though it's the conclusion which i would not accept it's a it's a conclusion that you would accept meaning that uh you know you willingly lay your life down for him in return for and you're not even sure what your returns are so for me i i think that that's very um uh, not a, not 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 the kind of thing that i would accept so if, if i was to lay my life down for for something or someone then i would like to know like um what what is the the return so if you if you were to say uh, uh, there was a truck coming and it was going to hit my children then in an instant I would stand in front of the truck if it saves the, 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 the children uh, so uh, then I know so the return is the life of uh, my, ch my children so this one is given lah. so yeah so I, I, for me I would, I, would, I would think of it that way and, and especially right. when it comes to God and when we say that uh, God is able to, to do things, He's great, He's all-powerful, He's omnipotent, He's omniscient, He's omni-everything, except that um, He cannot preserve your life. Then I think that, that, that um, that's not quite, not, not quite as attractive as you think it is. I, 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 seem to, I think that it's, it is not attractive at all. Um, to say that, um, and, this, and then you, you, you raise the question about... Um, uh, it is the, the gospel is foolishness to to some people then again you um it, it, it makes no sense to go forth and preach it to all the world really because first of all you don't know who is going to be receptive and who's the who are the foolish who will reject it and but you you it's, it's almost like god already knows that only you you and you will become uh, christians and we will be welcome to the kingdom of god but the rest I've already determined that you, 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 and you, and all the rest of you over there. Yep, I've decided not to choose you to enter the kingdom, kingdom of God. And I think that this is, this is not the kind of God that the Bible preaches. I don't think that this is the kind of God that that this is not God at all. Seriously, this this is probably somebody else. But it cannot be God. For someone who, who, who holds all the power of the universe, 
and then to suddenly say these kind of things, I think I think there's something wrong with it. Now, uh, yeah, okay, okay, maybe maybe you 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 should explain instead of me sure. me, me telling you my my conclusions. <laughs> hey, no problem at all. I mean, is that just the whole point of this discussion? But uh, there were so many issues there that I needed to respond to. You brought up predestination. You brought up the fact that uh, you know it sounds very cultic. Uh, and, and let me say first of all, it, it is not cultic. And a major difference is this: cults ask you to give their life for within the cult. Christ calls us to give his life, our lives, for the benefit of others outside. It's not to an organization. Jesus gave his life for the world, not to, uh, for his inner group alone. So uh, the idea is that he gave the life for everyone and that basically the, the disciples gave their lives for those, for even their enemies uh, in, in that sense, you know. So um, it's not cultic at all. The idea of cults, you look at Jonestown and all that, and I've, I've done a bit of study on cults and I've even did, done a live stream on that. Uh, those of you watching this can watch our uh, uh, explain apologetics live stream on cults. It's in one of our uh, live stream videos. If you look up uh, in the playlist of live streams, you would actually find it quite easily. So uh, the difference in the cults is it's very for the organization. You don't mix with outsiders. And that's why it is called cult. It's a separatist group that, that it's, it's inward looking. It's for us. But Christianity, it, it's very much different. Giving the life for the sake of the enemy, it's not cultic in any sense of that word, uh, at least in the way we understand modern Celtic movements. But let me address the point also of interpretation. I would say, Pepper, that I'm willing to challenge anyone on an in a, in a interpretive or exegetical, we call it exegetical basis, to show why this is merely my interpretation, because I feel that uh, if anyone feels there's any passage in scripture uh, that kind of challenges what I've said, they, they ought to be able to bring it up. And I, I, as you've noted, uh, I've responded to Isaiah 53, I've responded to every passage that is there. And if, let's say, someone raises a passage that I'm unable to respond to, I'll change my view. Uh, that, that's intellectual integrity, right? You, you change your view when you realize uh, the text is saying something other than what you espouse. Uh, but so far, Peppa, I'd have to tell you this. I've, I've done debates on predestination. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll tell you this, that, uh, you know, that I, I'm, I've still yet to come across a passage that really challenges uh, my position. And I'll be the first to change uh, when that happens. Um, so uh, with that said, I also want to address the other issue you raised up, which is the really, really question of the day. Why then should you accept it? Since I've already said it's not attractive, why then would you, why, why, why on earth would you have to do that? And the answer is this, Pepper, because you and I are both sinners, all sinners in the hands of God. And we basically either pay for our sins ourselves, uh, aka an eternity of judgment from God, or we allow the infinite son, Jesus Christ, to take your sins for you. And, and as C.S. Lewis says, there are only two types of people in this world, Pepper. People who say to God, your will be done. And people to whom God says, your will be done. So that, that's essentially the, the issue here. And, and you and I have this choice of saying, Jesus commands us uh, to follow him. The idea of repenting of sins, uh, believing in Christ, believing in Christ, repenting of sins and being baptized, it's not an invitation. It's a command. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, Jesus says, For all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, in light of the authority that has been given to him, go make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do all that I have commanded you. And you, you see that the idea of this, this gospel is very much a command. And I'm glad, Pepper. I mean, if you, if you come and say that, you know what? I understand what you're saying. This is not for me. I completely reject that. That's okay. That's, that's all right. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not happy with that. It, it grieves me, I'll be honest with you. But the fact is, you at least know what you are rejecting. As opposed to saying, some people saying, well, you know, you have a lovey-dovey God who is the Santa Claus in the sky who wants to just dish out, you know, healings to everybody when that's not really the God of the Bible and you end up not rejecting the actual God. And I hope you see where I'm coming from with this. I'm very happy if people reject and say, I understand now this is the God of the Bible. It's a God that commands the slaughter of the Amalekites, men, women, children, infants for Samuel 15. It's a God that destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a God that destroys and commands a lot of punishment. It's a God that commands the stoning of homosexuals, the stoning of adultery. Uh, it, it's a God who commands, uh, you know, stoning of someone who picks up sticks on the Sabbath. Uh, this is the God we're talking about here. And I'm not sugarcoating him, Pepper. I'm not trying to sugarcoat him. Uh, in my church, I did a series on explaining every one of those incidences because we need to look at them. So when you look at this God and the finally, 
he, dis- he kills his own son on the cross, right? And Jesus, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane is saying, you know, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. But the father decrees that he goes to the cross. That seems to be the go- very much like the God that I'm proposing. And I think the only reason why you should accept it, Pepper, is because it's true. I think you, what you should not be saying, in my opinion, and, and that's entirely up to you. This is just my thoughts. What you should not be saying is that whether this is attractive or unattractive, I think the real question should be, is it true or is it false? And I, I, I'm just wondering if, at least on that point, would you agree with me? That the question should be whether true or false, not attractive or unattractive. True or false for what? That God uh, is this great big um, non-perfect person? Is that oh, what you are asking? No, no, no. I'm just saying, the, the, no, I mean, God is perfect in all of his ways. I'm just saying that it's a God that commands these things. And I'm, I'm, I believe in the perfection of God. I just think we have a very different understanding of perfection and we're trying to match God into our little mode of what we deem perfect. But my point is, would you agree that the issue of accepting Christ or rejecting Christ does not fall upon the attractiveness of the offer, but rather on the veracity the truthfulness of the claim, meaning that even if Jesus' offer is not attractive, if it is true, if it is true, we should follow it regardless of how attractive it is. I'm just wondering, on that point at least, would you agree? Or would you say like, like, like uh, what's his name? Uh, Christopher Hitchens, even if it was true, I wondered, I mean, if God is in heaven, I'm happy to be in hell. Yeah. And, and, what, and what is the claim of Jesus again? Repent, believe, baptize, be, 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 uh, re, repent of your sin, believe in him, repent of your sins, and be baptized uh, for the forgiveness of sins. That you and I are sinners, that he offers forgiveness by belief, by faith in him alone. So my, I would ask, mm-hmm. why? why? Why would you need to repent of your sins um, and, and, and believe in, 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 uh, in Jesus? Why? What's the, what's the, what is that, what's the reason for, for repenting of your sins? Look, look if, if, if we did, if I did something wrong, and I think that for most of us, whenever we do something wrong, we will feel bad about it. And we will think, let's, let's not do that anymore. Okay, let's, let's, uh, that's, that's not something we should, it's the wrong thing to do. Um, and if, uh, if it's a very big, big crime, like um, rape or murder or whatever, then you, you actually have to pay a price for it. Yeah, you, don't, you don't say, yeah, you don't say, you know, listen, um, I found somebody who's willing to pay the price for me. So you punish him and I'll go scot-free. But, but, I've repented. So I really, I really don't, don't, don't see um, how true that could be. I really don't see it. Uh, to, to, for Jesus to say that he's the way, the truth, and the life, you know, if, 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 if it's true, then uh, yes, we should uh, follow him. But I don't see how it can be true. That's, that's, I think that's is the it, big thing. Is it a question of logic, the logic behind someone paying for your sins, or is it the issue of him raising from the dead? Which is the one that you are not? Like saying it can't be true. I, I think I think uh, as a whole, as a whole, I, I I don't want to I don't want to pick one thing and then say okay if 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 you can prove that one thing then you know uh, back in Christianity you know with 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 uh, singing hymns and everything reading my Bible every day <laughs> and praying for an hour, uh, which is what I used to do. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 is this series of things that just do does not make sense. And and I know that you you can't answer all the questions that I have like like right now, uh, I've searched for the answer. So I, I have a feeling that if I can't find the answer, I have a feeling that you can't provide the answer either. Uh, you, the, the, the explanations that you've given, Sam, they are fantastic. And I, I, I know that you're going to make a great uh, a theologian. Uh, and I, I, I've, I've not read any of your books, but I know they are coming. Sam, this, this is, uh, I, I can see that. Uh, however, your arguments are not, not uh, original. Uh, I have to say that they are based on very old arguments. Arguments have been made by uh, many, many, um, you know, great Christian thinkers and 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 and, and uh, theologians of of the past. And and that's that's not a, that's not a crime. It's it's not a, a sin. It's not even something that you should be ashamed of. You know, just because you don't have original thought, like who has original thought? Like seriously. So I think that that's that's uh, very commendable on your part. But. Yeah, if you're asking, if you're trying to pin me down on just one thing, I think that that's very, very impossible. So I, I'm not asking you or anyone to try and answer just one, sure. one big thing. Is it is this so many, so many uh, things wrong? Uh, I I recently read the last book I read about 
this uh, Christian uh, um, um, uh, thing was uh, by um, I can't remember the guy's name. I think it's Dan Barker. He he, he it's a used former to pastor, be right? yeah. former pastor, if I, if I'm not mistaken. But, but he 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 gave, he gave this this uh, story in his book called uh, Godless. If if I remember the name of the book correctly, <laughs> it's called Godless. Uh, so it it's uh, he said that if if a friend of yours invited you to go and see his beautiful garden, and then you go and and take a look, and and your friend has this big garden and he points to, to this uh, uh, a bed of, of flowers and he says, aren't these like the prettiest flowers you've ever seen? And if you look at the flowers, you think to yourself, my God, these are really the best flowers like ever. Like, I've never seen flowers that are be more beautiful than this. This, this. this bed of flowers is just fantastic. I've never seen anything better. Like the, it, you can't get anything, anything better. But then you look around the garden and you think the rest of the garden is just crap. It's, it's just that old tires everywhere, um, long long grass and 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 dead dead plants everywhere, and, and then you, you when you tell your friend, hey, what about the rest of the garden? Why is it so bad? So your friend says, but no, wait, don't 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 look at the rest of the garden. Just just focus on this this bed of flowers. But you tell your friend, look, I I can't say that you have a wonderful garden, if the rest of the garden is just bad. You know, even if half the garden was bad, I would still have to say that you don't have a great garden. But you know, in your in your friend's mind is like you know, the, come on, you, I've invited you to my garden. This is how you 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 embarrass and humiliate me. Come on, this this, you you're just like you know like 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 unappreciative. Like I've got this bed of great flowers, and all you can focus on is the wrong things in uh, in the garden. So really, if you're asking me to 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 agree on this bed of flowers, and then you say, look, based on this bed of flowers this beautiful bed of flowers and i can't deny that it's not beautiful uh, then i have to also agree that the rest of the garden as a whole is also beautiful and and i think that uh, it, it's difficult it's it's it's, it's I, I can't do that and i th i don't think that anyone can do that would, would you mind if i just ask you a quick question yep is beauty subjective i mean don't, don't you believe beauty is subjective but, okay, uh, um, just, just, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I just wanted to follow up. I wanted to follow up. Yeah, just, if you don't mind. It's, it's, it's subjective. Okay. okay. Beauty is subjective. Uh -huh, sorry. But what, what, if, what if I told you that the guy who owns the garden, your friend who owns the garden, actually agrees with you that the rest of the garden is lousy and, 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 and that he had not done a good job in, in cleaning it up and, and he's got no reason to clean it up really. Yeah. He's just, for him, he's like, look, I, I've, I've given up on the rest of the garden. I, I'm just focused on this bed of flowers here. No, and absolutely. I, all I want you to do is take a look at this bed of flowers. But in my mind, I keep thinking that, look, your, your, your whole garden is just terrible. Uh, I have to agree that, okay, yes, I will agree that your, this bed of roses, a uh, red bed, bed of flowers is great, but everything else, every other plant in the, in the garden is just dying, dead, or just unkept. And, and on that basis, then I have to say that you don't have a wonderful garden. I, yeah. I think that your garden is a, a terrible garden. Right. So, I mean, I, I, the reason I asked the question, Pepper, is whether beauty is subjective or not. Uh, it's because this is the exact issue that I think Willie Pope brought up uh, in my debate with him in MCKL, Methodist College, Kuala Lumpur. Um, and, and what Willie basically said is incompetent creator uh, or something to that effect. You know, and uh, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm quoting him correctly. Uh, and any, uh, so, yeah, yeah. So what, what he basically is saying is that since creation is incompetent, you have an incompetent creator. But, um, so what I, my response to him is probably, I guess, and, and I guess we're going to have to close with this because it's I'm not sure where you're watching this from where you are. Uh, it's about, it, it's going to be midnight uh, <laughs> right here. Uh, so uh, I'll just, I'll just respond to this and I'll just let you, you know, maybe say just a sure. few words. So uh, my response to Willie was this, that beauty or, comp uh, or basically the idea of it being uh, compet competency or, 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 you know, if e efficiency or whatever you want to call it, is basically based on intentionality, meaning what did the creator of the garden intend to create? And that's how you're going to judge whether he is competent or incompetent. So I would completely agree with what you said. If the creator of the garden says, yeah, well, you know, I did this, but I didn't quite do that. Then I'd agree with you. It's completely incompetent. And you, yeah, you have good reason to reject it, Pepper. But the issue is, if the creator intentionality, his intentionality was to demonstrate a contrast between that which is beautiful and that which is not beautiful, if that was his purpose, using your analogy, then it seems that his competency uh, or the wonderfulness of his garden has to be judged on the basis of his intentionality rather 
than on what the outcome is based on our subjective perception. So I wouldn't disagree with you when you look at the world, there's so much of problems with it. I won't deny that. But if you're going to judge it and say, well, God made an imperfect world, we've got to first of all realize what was his intention. And we can judge perfection or imperfection based on the intentionality. But again, this is a whole different topic that I think could be just another session in and of itself. I'm just so grateful for you, uh, Pepper, that uh, you know that you've been willing to to, to share with us. And uh, I, it, yeah, so uh, and it's my prayer. And I no, no, I won't make any. Uh, I won't make. There's no secret that it's my prayer that you once again find your faith in, in back in Christ. Uh, I mean. Uh, I, you know, that faith is a gift from God, Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, and I pray that he grants that gift to you. But I mean, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, no, um, but I have to say that you, you, uh, you are the first person whom, uh, uh, or maybe the second person I've actually publicly uh, sp spoken to about my disbelief. Uh, the first time was to uh, for one of the newspapers because uh, there was this call by some um, crazy Muslims who said that we should we should be able to kill uh, uh, atheists. So I thought that was just too much, and no other atheists were were, were willing to be uh, interviewed. So I actually I, I was interviewed. I think it was by CNA. I, I think uh, or, or one of those or. or, or or Action News Network, A A A A S N or whatever it is. No, but A S N is something else. <laughs> one one of those. Right? Yeah, well, I was I was I was actually on 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 video, and you are the second person because I I'm not the the the, the type who wants to uh, even talk about it. So, uh, for me, I think it's a very very personal thing. Uh, I I um, I'm I'm willing to listen, uh, and I'm willing to to consider new new information. But I have to say that uh, I've been. Um, I've searched for a long time. Uh, I, I don't. I don't discount any anything. But if uh, like uh, like you you like you you said yourself, if you if, if someone can show you something else, something new uh, for you to consider, you would consider. It. And I think that I'm I'm uh, very very similar. Uh, I have that same kind of thinking as well. It, it it doesn't benefit me to be blind to something. I think that I think that uh, if someone can show me something, then uh, yes, I I would. Uh, consider it, but however, I I I, I don't mean to to um, uh, um, uh, disappoint you. Sure. Uh, the points that you brought up today uh, did, did not did not intrigue me at all. It 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 it, it, it seems you sound like me when I would was trying to justify the the things that just could not be answered in the Bible. I remember asking my pastor, and my pastor was saying, you know, some things you just leave alone. That was his answer. I mean, like, I was like, what? Wait, you, you, you have to answer these things, you know, or at least try, you know. But he was like, no, like some things, uh, brother, you should just leave alone. And I, uh, that, that, that for me, I left it alone for a long time, but I just couldn't. And, and um, uh, yeah, when, when you were trying to explain it, it, it kind of reminded me of myself trying to, to explain things and then trying to accept uh, certain things. Uh, but uh, when I brought myself out of the equation and tried to look at the arguments from both sides from a neutral point of view, I, I, I have to say that uh, Christianity brought up more questions than it, it, it answered uh, uh, and questions which I thought were really important. I'm not talking about, are you sure Gideon was one of the leaders of Israel? I think that that's, you know, I, that, that whether he was or he wasn't, that doesn't really matter, like, you know. But for me, like, uh, like things like, like, like what you just said, whether God is obliged to do things, or whether he should do things, whether he can do things, or, or, or you know, I, I think these are the ones that are important to me. Uh, I think that these are the big questions about God. Um, but yeah, uh, time, time is marching on. So uh, to me, um, I'm, I'm, I'm daytime over here. So maybe, yeah, if, if um, we can speak again, uh, that'll be quite nice. Yeah, I thought this, this was quite interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Pepper, for your time. And for those of you who don't know Pepper, uh, yeah, once again, thanks to you, Pepper. And uh, for those of you who don't know Pepper, he's one of the nicest guys I've met uh, from the atheistic side. And there are many of them who are nice as well. But he really stood out. He was so hospitable to us when we went to, I remember the uh, apostle. It's called Loya Boro, I believe. I think the place is called. Is yeah, it? it was at Loya Boro, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, he, 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 yeah sorry, you were saying? Yeah, no, no, just saying, yeah, we, we, we go, uh, two of us, we go quite a, a while back. I think more than, more than uh, six, seven years, maybe? 
2013 yes. 2013 uh, 2013 yeah that's how long that's how long we we we've gone back and i think i think we uh i i videotaped your first debate with with uh, willy uh, in yeah. the in that church in uh, the, the, you organized it one in, in some church that I was remember. in 2012 I was, yeah yeah i was one of the video guys uh, that was the first time i i i i, I saw you yeah, yeah. and so, right now yeah. right now i'm trying to bury all those videos so but anyway <laughs> no I, I thought I, I, if, if, if you ask me, um, I, I have to concede that uh, Apostle and Mesh uh, actually lost the, the, the debates. Um, yeah, I have to say that you, you were more polished in your, in your delivery. Um, even with Navin and, and Willie, I think that they, yeah, they could have done a bit more homework uh, in their delivery. I think yeah, you, both of you brought, brought good points. But in, in terms of delivery, I think that you and what was the other, the other uh, pastor? Mark Tan, Mark pastor Mark Tan. He's the uh, other director yeah, of Explain I Apologetics. Thought, I thought he was very good in in their delivery, and and I think that the, the delivery made a lot of difference. I think. Right. Thanks so much for the kind <laughs> words, and thanks for the encouragement as well. We'll definitely love to have you back, Pepper. Uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. So, well, we've we've got a sign off here, and uh, if, if you're new to Explain Apologetics channel, uh, do consider hitting the subscribe button. And if you like this video, feel free to share it as well. Um, we will be having another guest shortly tomorrow, I believe. Uh, Maybe tomorrow, if not the day after tomorrow, we'll keep you posted on Explain Apologetics Facebook page. Uh, but until next time, uh, on behalf of uh, Pepper Lim and myself, have a pleasant week ahead. It's, it's going to be Monday for you. Bye for now.